Well, if you've got your Bibles, we'll turn to uh, 1 Samuel 30. We're fast drawing to the end of 1 Samuel. And, and really, I was thinking about a title for uh, this morning's sermon. Uh, and I was thinking, one of the thoughts I had was that it's a turning point. And, uh, you know, in David's life, it was a turning point. And things looked, as I read it, you'll see, uh, things look pretty bleak, uh, but God. And, and it's that crossroads we come to when things are looking at their very worst uh, that God intersects, intercedes into that, and then uh, that is the turning point. And, and sometimes God takes us to the very edge uh, in order for us to see the mighty works of God. Uh, and <clears throat> when we look back on those times, uh, even though they're difficult and painful and, uh, you know, sleepless nights and worry and anxiety and all those things that come into those, uh, when we reach that turning point, and God intercedes, uh, we look back on those times and say that was the most vibrant time we had with God. We knew the reality of God uh, in that most difficult time. And I guess, you know, Brian's going to be giving his testimony, and, and he was in a very dark place uh, when he called out to God. Uh, and God has transformed him. You can see the transformation in his life. Uh, over these times. And, and I guess each one of us has got a story to tell of uh, hard times that we've been through and then recognizing that God is into it. So I was thought about t t uh, a turning point. The other title I thought was God does not fill until he's emptied us. And uh, the emptying of us is usually quite painful because it's stripping away ourself our self-importance, our self-image, our self, it's a stripping away of that, and that can be incredibly painful. But when God fills, we know the reality of the living God in our lives. And so that was another title, but I settled on this one. <laughs> the third, third choice was, when we meet the bottom of the pit, that's rock bottom, when we can go no further, when everything is lost, then God, are we trusting God? Do we trust God? So that was my final attempt at the title for this part. Let's read it together. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it and had taken captive the women and everyone else in it, both young and old, they killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men reached the cloud, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had, had no strength left to weep. Have you ever been there when you've wept so much, you've got no strength to weep anymore? David's two wives had been captured, Ahinoam uh, of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Na uh, Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were taking, thinking or talking of stoning him. Each had a, <coughs> was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord, his God. So he's lost his wives. The men have lost their women and all the children. The men are turning on David because it was David's idea to go up and fight for the Philistines against Israel. And, and we, we learned last week that God had stopped that happening and, and he'd gone back to his hometown, Ziklag. And then he's just come back and there's smoke rising above the place. And the men are coming back, hopefully for the comfort of their families and everything else. And, and it's all been destroyed. David, what are you doing? So they were angry with David. So they were going to stone him. But David found strength in the Lord his God. When things get so bad, 
he turned to God and he found the strength in God. Then David said to Abiathar, the priest and the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Abiathar brought it to him and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. David and the 600 men with him came to the Besor Valley where some stayed behind. 200 of them were too exhausted to cross the valley. But David and the other 400 continued the pursuit. They found an Egyptian in a field and brought him to David. They gave him water to drink and food to eat, part of a cake of pressed figs and two cakes of raisins. He ate and was revived, for he had not eaten any food or drunk any water for three days and three nights. David asked him, who do you belong to? Where do you come from? He said, I'm an Egyptian, the slave of an Amalekite. My master abandoned me when I became ill three days ago. We raided the Negav of the Kerathites, some territory belonging to Judah, and the Negav of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag. David asked him, can you lead me down to this raiding party? He answered, swear to me before God that you will not kill me or hand me over to my master, and I will take you down to them. He led David down, and there they were, scattered over the countryside, eating, drinking, and reveling because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from Judah. David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day, and none of them got away except 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else they had taken. David brought everything back. He took all the flocks and herds. His men drove them ahead of the other livestock, saying, this is David's plunder. And David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow him, who were left behind at the Besa Valley. They came out to meet David and the men with him. As David and his men approached, he asked them how they were. But all the evil men and troublemakers among David's followers said, because they did not go out with us, we will not share with them the plunder we recovered. However, every man may take his wife and children and go. David replied, no, my brothers, you must not do that with what the Lord has given us. He has protected us and delivered into our hands the raiding party that came against us. Who will listen to what you say? The share of the man who stayed with the supplies is to be the same as that of him who went down into the battle. All will share alike. David made this a statute, an ordinance for Israel from that day to this. When David reached Ziklag, he sent some of the plunder to the elders of Judah, who were his friends, saying, Here is a gift for you from the plunder of the Lord's enemies. David sent it to those who were at Bethel, Ramoth, the Negev, and Jatia, to those at Arior, Aroi, Shifmoth, Eshtemo, and Rachel, to those of the towns of Jeremielites and the Kenites, to those at Horma, Bosh, Bor, Ashan, Athak, and Hebron, <laughs> and, those, and to those in all the other places where he and his men had roamed. May God add his blessing to this, his word. I love those uh, lovely words. <laughs> it's interesting when David was at uh, the pit, they'd just returned back. Uh, they were exhausted. They'd been up. Uh, they'd been preparing to fight the Israelites on the side of the Philistines. And now they would return <clears throat> all this distance back. They were looking to get home. You could just imagine they were hungry, uh, they were exhausted, and uh, it wasn't far to go. And then you could just imagine the missus has got the dinner on, uh, you know, there's, there's a warm bed, the kids are in bed, and, and everything's just going to be great. Knock on my slippers, sit back, relax, and then they see all this smoke coming up. They get there, everything's gone. All the cattle's gone, all the food's gone, everything's destroyed. No uh, wives, no children, abandoned. The whole town is empty. You can imagine how desperate that seemed to them. Uh, they, <clears throat> the difficulty that they would 
have felt. And, you know, we can deal with most things that come along our way. But when you're exhausted, when you're hungry, when you're hurting and tired, and then these things drop on you, how do you cope with that? It's like you're at your lowest ebb and then somebody jumps on your shoulders and pushes you down. That's the picture that I'm getting here is that they were absolutely down and out. And David was the leader and it was all on his shoulders. Everything, the buck always stops with the leader. And so he was going to have to deal with this. And then he's got dissension in the ranks Because the guys are upset, they're hungry, they're hurting, and it's David's, they're going to find somebody's fault. It's David's fault. We're going to go after him. We're going to stone him. So you imagine David is feeling pretty low at this moment in his life. He's got nowhere to turn but God. And so he turns to God, and he looks to God. And he finds strength in the Lord. God had purposed for all this to happen in David's life. It wasn't an accident. God had allowed it to happen to bring him to the crossroads. He wanted David, if you think of David, right up to this moment in time, David was calling the shots. David had gone to the Philistines. David had gone to uh, Achish. David had... Uh, done all these things on his own back. Throughout all of that, you never saw him inquiring of God. Even when he was going up against Israel, he wasn't inquiring of God. And God overruled. And uh, Akish listened to the other Philistine leaders and said, uh, no, you, you need to back off. You need to go back to Ziklag. Uh, they don't want you fighting with us just in case you turn in the middle of the battle and fight against us. us. That was God's doing. He was protecting David and he was protecting the promise here that he'd made to David. They'd lost everything. Everything was lost. David had hit rock bottom. David and his men wept. They left their voices and they wept until they had no more power to weep. Have you been there? You've been there. You've been there. I know you've been there. You've cried so much that you're all cried out. There's no more tears. That's when we hit rock bottom. You've got nothing left. No one in Israel could help him. The Philistines didn't want him. His family was gone. All he owned was gone. Even his friends had turned against him. Every support was gone except God. This was the best place David could be. It doesn't sound it, does it? It really doesn't sound it, but it was the very best place David could be because God wanted him. He said, all I have is God. David was strengthened by the Lord. And God has to empty us before he can fill us. We have to be completely broken before we can be filled. We have to be squeezed out of ourselves before God can enter in and refill us. You you see, there's this battle going on inside us. And and it's, it's my selfishness of what I want and how I'm going to live my life and what I'm going to do and what I 
purpose and, and I've got the strength to do it. And if, I'm, if I have enough positive mental attitude to go and do it, then I will, I will succeed. If I put the effort in, if I work hard, if I, if I, if I, if I, if I, if I, and God goes, it's not about you. What we need to do is squeeze the I out of you to allow me in. And that's why he crushes us. That's why we go to that place that nobody wants to go that is so painful. But when we realize it's God who's doing that so that we can recognize and know him in our lives, then he will strengthen us. David knew he was weak at this point. Boy, did he know he was weak and he needed God's strength. He needed strength for recognition. He needed strength for for his brokenness. He needed strength for his repentance. He needed strength for determination to win back what the enemy had stolen. He needed the resurrection strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we need in our lives. We need the resurrection strength, but we need to die to ourselves first. And, and, and it's so that we can't, we can't actually manufacture dying to ourselves. It's God who does that to us. It's God who squeezes us down. And so it feels like death. Because there's nothing left that you can do other than say, help me, God. And that's exactly where David came to. He said, I remember the promise that you gave me, God, and the calling you have given me. In, in a way, he came to his own mind. It's like the, uh, the prodigal. You know, he, he took his inheritance and then he squandered his inheritance. Uh, and he was in with the pigs, eating the pig swell. And he woke up one morning And he said, my father's servants are doing better than I am. This was the beginning of him coming to his own mind. He said, tell you what, I'm going to go back to my father. Just like David here. He's he's got to the point where he's right at the rock bottom. And he says, tell you what, I need to go back to my father. I need to return to what he's promised me and the calling that he has given me. David said, God has promised me to be king of Israel. I've been ordained as king, but I'm a king in waiting. But I need to trust God. I trusted God when I went against Goliath, and now I need to trust him again. Are we willing to start living according to our destiny? you believe you have a destiny, a destiny to fulfill? We were singing that at the prayer meeting, weren't we? I think we sang it last Sunday as well, didn't we? It's a good song to sing, but do we mean it? Are we willing to fulfill our destiny? How can we start living towards that destiny? Well, it's by allowing him to govern our lives. And David inquired of the Lord. He called Abiathar, the priest, the son of Helenic. Uh, Bring me the effort, he says. Brought, brought it to him. David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Can you remember the difference between enquire and inquire? We did it a couple of weeks ago. Can you remember? Yeah. Yeah. You want to illuminate... <laughs> Just putting you on the spot there as well. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> I like it. When we inquire with an E, inquire, we're just asking. We ask. When we inquire, we seek. And, and that's the difference. And, and, and it's interesting because the Bible here is saying that he inquired. It meant he sought the mind of the Lord. 
and, and we have to work hard. It's not just asking God, it's actually seeking God. And there's a big difference between that. We really need to understand what it is to inquire of the Lord. We need to dig deep. We need to meditate upon the word. It's, it's not just asking a question of God, but it's actually looking for the answer so hard, so persistent, so focused. That's inquiring. David had been backsliding and now he's seeking God. He brought everything to the Lord. Nothing was done just because it was done before. He asked God about everything. Are we in that place of asking, inquiring from God to know the truth? Going back to the destiny thing, are, are, are you inquiring of God what your destiny is? You know, it, it's, it's, it's going to be something you need to work on, but you need to know the call of God on your life. Because otherwise you just drift. You, you see, what, we, what did we do a couple of weeks ago about setting our face like flint? To, well, no, Jesus set his face like flint towards Jerusalem. He knew what his destiny was. Nothing was going to deviate him. He still ministered to people as he went. But he was determined, this is where I'm going. That is my destiny. Nothing will stop me getting there. But he knew that that was his destiny. So you need to know what your destiny is. What is your calling? What is God calling you to do? And then you need to set your face like flint towards it and not give up. You need to pursue it. And you see, when God gives you a promise, then he'll always give you something to do in the fulfillment of that promise. He says, you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover everything. So God has given him the promise, pursue them, and you will get everything back. Go do, and I promise to be with you. You see, when, when you know God's call on your life, and you set your face like flint towards your destiny... God will ask you to do things and he will provide for you in that. But it requires a step of obedience. David was obedient. He had strengthened himself in the Lord. He'd inquired of the Lord. And now God told him what to do. And he did it. He was on a mission now from God. Gosh, it must have felt good, eh? Can you imagine he was, he was going up and he was fighting with the Philistines against Israel? That wasn't God's plan. That was David's plan. But now, God's with him. He's on God's mission. Of course, there must have been a spring in his step. You know, his, 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 his wives have been taken away. Uh, the children of, the, of his soldiers have been taken away. Their wives, all the, all the food, all the provision. He's destitute. And yet there's a spring in his step because he's on God's mission. God's told him, go, get the raiding party, and then you'll get everything back. And it's a spring in his step. He's going out in faith. Just like Alison sat there in faith. <laughs> just see, it's going out in faith. He's loving it. He's loving it. And he's going along. And then the guys say, look, we found this Egyptian. He's half dead. <laughs> and David goes, he, said, he could have just said, I'll put a sword through him. Let's finish him off. He looks a bit miserable anyway. <laughs> but he didn't. He said, look, let's take care of him. Let's feed him. Let's give him stuff. Build him up. Was that by accident? No. Oh. That was a God incident. David gets him up and says, by the way, who are you? Well, I, I'm an Egyptian who works for the Amalekites. Really? What have you been up to? Well, we went and took Ziglag out. Really? Why are you here? Well, my master, I was too ill, so he just left me to die. 
all right, well, we've, we've looked after you. Any chance of telling us where this Reagan party is? What's the chances of that, eh? God. But God. But God. He's got a spring in his step. He's hope. His faith's there. He's got faith to believe that God is now, he's on a mission to God, and God's going to make provision. Little Egyptian guy. He's got the answer. Then he goes up, and they're all drunk. All these Amalekites. They've got all the plunder, and they're laying it in. And they're celebrating everything else. David goes in and wipes them all out. God's made provision for David. And guess what? He gets more back than he started with. God blessed him. And then he, he, there's this thing with the sharing it out. See, he's, he's a good leader, David, because he realizes that some of his men have been a bit moony-faced because they did all the fighting. And the 200 that had weighed back, they weren't going to get anything. And he says, no, no, no. We're a unit. We're unified. It was God's provision. And whether you fought for it or whether you waited here, we're all taking part in what God has provided for us. See, that's good leadership. And he says, we're having nothing of it yourselves. So David had come away from his backsliding. And there's a fresh spring in his step. God's with him. And he knows God's with him. Why? Because by faith he's experienced it. I can't explain to you unless you've experienced it. But there is nothing more exciting than when God interjects in your life and does something that you've never expected or ever done for yourself. It's, it's when you're absolutely flat out and you've got nothing and, a, and money drops through your door to meet a bill. It's when the car breaks down and somebody stops and says, do you want a lift? It's, you know, it's, it's those moments where you just haven't got a clue what's going on. And somebody, God just sends somebody, just like that Egyptian, send somebody to help just at the time when you need it. You see, David had stopped backsliding and now he was on the mission that God had given him. How exciting is that? He recognizes the promises that God had given him and now he's going to fulfill them. David was strengthened in the Lord. He inquired of the Lord. He believed God's promises. He did what God told him to do. Don't forget that bit. Obedience. You see, God will not actually tell you unless you purpose in your heart to obey him. You need, you need to obey you need to have the intention of obedience before God will reveal. So you can't weigh it up. Because he'll never reveal it to you if all you're going to do is weigh it up and say, well, God, maybe. But I've got a better plan. <laughs> it's not going to work that way. David showed unexpected care and kindness to others. Little acts. What did you say earlier? Little acts of kindness. That's what we're to do. We don't know what God's going to do with that. Somebody might get saved because of a little act of kindness that you do for someone else. And David saw it as the Lord's victory. It was the Lord's plunder. It wasn't his to hand out. It was God's. So he gave glory to God where God deserved it. And he shared the rewards with others. And then he went and he gave, he sent it to Judah and he sent it to all those places that I couldn't pronounce. Sent it all over there because he wanted to mend the relationships with Judah because of what he'd done in his backsliding. David wanted to mend the relationships. Ephesians 4, 7 and 8 says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Jesus had, has spoil for his victory to give to you. Are you prepared to be strengthened by God 
when all around is falling apart? Are you prepared to inquire of God for his will to be done? And are you willing to obey God when he reveals his will and then receive the blessing? Are you willing to trust God <laughs> in everything? So important. Let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word this morning. Lord, what an object lesson we've had. Uh, Lord, that we would trust you. Not trust in man, but trust in you. Lord, David recognized his backslidden state when all had been taken from him. And then he was on a mission for you. And Lord, help us to see our destiny, uh, that we want to follow you. We want to trust in you and even go the hard yards to have that personal relationship with you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.